palabras eran en castellano. This is a workshop in English, <laughs> so I I have to uh, to start with a little bit with the matter. So so I'm going to uh, to develop a little bit the, the basic ideas we're going to deal throughout the the workshop. Uh, so as as um, Pat has said. Um, so the city is a very is a very complex uh, system. It's difficult to to say something about it in a in a very precise way, so as to make proper pre uh, predictions uh, as well as to to know exactly how the past was. And uh, but in general, we could say that uh, in our in our societies, in our current societies, so we are facing really complicated problems. And, uh, and the methods that are provided by the, by the specialized sciences, the specialized disciplines, are not enough as to handle, as to face properly the, this, these issues. Hmm? So, in some sense, we could say that uh, all these problems uh, demand so some other way to deal with, and, uh, and the reality is actually so and, and it's developing a kind of, of complexity that we need to harness in order to, to manage our very existence. It's, not, it's nothing else. Uh, but, but what we really have is not only that our system of science is, is, is not enough, that we just have to research a little bit deeper, the, the real problem, we, we, as we will see, as, as uh, Rainer will, will show us, uh, the real problem is that reality, in a sense, uh, is much more sophisticated as what we have seen. So it's not only the que a question of, of how we organize sciences, but it's a way how reality really works. Hmm? But the theory of systems, uh, this is what we are going to deal with and is going to delve in some manner in an introductory way in any case, it's not going to be perfectly deep and we are going to touch actually only some of the, of the parts of it, offers indeed, so a path in the, in the foundational aspects to, to, to make some interdisciplinary approaches to try to understand how the complexity of the world really, really works. Hmm? And, uh, and this uh, involves uh, three fundamental aspects. On the one, on the one side, uh, how complexity is much, uh, how complexity is a structure, and uh, how complexity evolves. Hmm? These are the, the three fundamental questions we want to deal. And I think the title itself of the of the workshop uh, speaks about. Hmm? So. So I mentioned what, what he's going to provide us is, is uh, an introduction into the general foundations of, of systems. Hmm? Uh, and in so far, such conceptualization constitutes a keystone for the effective articulation of, of scientific but also practical disciplines. Hmm? Uh, in the primer initiative, you may have great that it belongs to the primary, so primary means of promotion of interdisciplinary methodologies in, a, in a education and research. Right? But it plays a little bit with the, with the words because primary is also, it represents also so the fundaments or a book uh, that is containing so the, the fundaments. And, uh, and our purpose is to develop, as I mentioned previously, uh, to develop uh, Research projects, but also educational projects, uh, to introduce this interdisciplinarity. Hmm? As also mentioned, so the city, I think, is is a very is a very way is a very interesting way to come into the matter. Uh, yes, it's very, uh, because because it's something we are we are always dealing with. So we are living in cities. Uh, so the complexity of the city itself is something that is perfectly evident to any of us, and uh, and we can uh, we will see uh, in a practical even in a practical way because we're going to visit, for example, the Museo de Leon, and uh, we will see so so the different so the evolution of the city, so how particular historical developments open new possibilities and and so on. 
I think it's, it's a very nice example, and uh, in particular, so the studies that Rainer has done in, uh, in Bologna so are, are a very good starting point as well to, to delve into, the, into this issue. In, a, in, a, in another uh, sense, uh, it's also interesting to other of the objectives that we have been always dealing in our, in our courses, and is addressing the relation that was also pointed by Pat between design and ethics. So the urban planning uh, can be handled in this, in this sense. Uh, what we are, what, what we do when we are planning properly a city, and this is in particularly well uh, observed when a good plan is developed. On, for example, in the Renaissance, there, there are very nice examples. But it, but also in the 20th century, and there's lots lots of projects. Uh, some of them are can be uh, call it utopias, uh, but. It, but in a, in a sense, the the idea is to is to develop uh, so the, the the system of the city, the system of the all the living beings that are related to the city, make that they they can uh, cooperate together very properly. The life that is developed within the cities is nice and and is just and so on. Uh, in some sense, we could be uh, approaching to something that it has been present in, in, in philosophy uh, since the Greek, the concept of Carlo Ka uh, which is the, the, the uh, meeting of two towns, Carlos uh, and Arathos, so the good and the beautiful. So uh, this is also something that we have been trying to collect in our in our courses, for example, in our summer courses, we always have some artistic part, like for example the concerts and so on. Last last September, we did uh, um, a workshop, a sound painting workshop. But let me introduce you. I, we have mentioned names, but uh, but I want you to talk a little bit more. So about the main speaker is going to be uh, uh, developing the matter. So Ryan Zimmerman. Um, I want to give you just a short introduction uh, about him. Uh, he first studied physics in the Imperial College in, in London, and in 1977 uh, he, he received his doctor uh, thesis in mathematics by the Freie Universität, uh, Universität Berlin. Uh, afterwards, he so that was that was. A doctor in mathematics, but then he, he developed uh, studies in, in philosophy, and in 1988 he received his, his PhD in philosophy by the Technische Universität Berlin. Uh, in 1995 he incorporated in the Munich University of Applied Science, and in 1998 he was a professor of natural philosophy, he was habilitated as professor in Kassel. In, uh, in a couple of years after, uh, he was uh, in Cambridge, uh, in, the, in the Clare Hall of Cambridge, and he became a, a full member of the, of the Clare Hall, and he did several stays in, in Cambridge. Afterwards, in 2001 and 2003, uh, he was in the University of Bologna, and it's where he developed a uh, specific work about the emergence of, of, of the cities, how the city evolves. Very interesting work. You have you have the, the articles in the in the documentation page in the in the web page of the workshop, um, and this is something that we will also leave. Not only this, but other papers, other texts for the development of the of the workshop. We will leave it in a in in a in our shop here behind the, the San Isidoro. We will give you the, the instructions. So that was done uh, concerning so the city of Bologna, but but this is a, a relevant uh, study that that uh, represents so. Uh, a starting point for the studies of the of the cities. 
In 2006, he was in Salzburg. He was, he has also been in the in the uh, in the te, uh, in the um, Sydney Metropolitan Studies that's in, in Berlin in 2010 and 2011. And now he's going to be invited professor in the Technische Universität Wien, so in Vienna. Uh, he's the president of the of the um, Institute for Design Science. Hmm? Uh, in, in Germany, He's member of Bitrum. Bitrum is, is a group that uh, for which this uh, this initiative primer has started. Uh, he's member of many scientific societies. Among them, another who has collaborated in the in the organization of, of this event and others, the Bertan Lampi Center for the Study of System Sciences. He has lots of literature. Many, many scientific papers, many co and, and very vast uh, so, um, literature in this, uh, as well in papers as, as in contributions to congresses. Many books uh, I like in particular. So the some book that uh, that I think would be also interesting if you want to talk a little bit in, in his approach, the book of on Espinosa uh, that was edited in 2011, I think. Right? Mm -hmm. The book on, on selling, that, that, uh, he has several uh, productions about selling, and one of them is going to, to come out shortly. Uh, contributions in encyclopedias, editions, and, and so on. But not only that, uh, he has also uh, artistic literature, so he has uh, edited recently. So uh, a novel, and, which is actually a part uh, of, a, of a project uh, that will contain several parts of this, of this larger novel. Uh, tomorrow we will have Gordana Dodi Kankervik. I will make a short introduction to her. She's from the Malardalen University of Sweden. Uh, that will be through, through a, a web conference. Uh, I will give you the details afterwards. But uh, I think I haven't given so the thankfulness to all the institutions that have been involved. So I, we have been talking about the University of Leon, this is uh, evident, uh, and the Munich University of Applied Science. But as the, the venue, uh, we have to be thankful very especially to San Isidoro. San Isidoro, San Isidoro offered us this, this place uh, because previously it was planned to be developed in Sierra Pamble, but in Sierra Pamble, too many things were going on, so we didn't have plus to the place to, to develop the, the workshop, and they offer us this very uh, nice place. Yeah? And uh, this is also something that I that I will ask you uh, to contribute in some manner, and is uh, we can. Uh, if you, if you want to, to continue, for example, this uh, discussing afterwards, we can have dinner here, or we can have lunch. They are going to offer us a, a special prize, but this is also, I think, a way to contribute somehow to the hostage of the, of the, to the, of, of, of the San Isidoro. And of course, I'm very thankful for your participation, for being here. Muchas gracias a todos los que no me estaban siguiendo en inglés. And I I'm going to do now a very also short introduction concerning more theoretical questions. Um, so first, I would like to recall, uh, in order to understand what what this understanding of complexity is all about, I would like to start uh, with what we could call the classical picture. Mm -hmm. uh, and this could be very well represented by a figure, so Ramon Lull, do you know? He's, he's from the Middle Ages, uh, a very interesting author. He was philosopher, logician, uh, writer. He has, most of his work is in, is in Catalan, but he has also in Arabic, something written in Spanish, in Latin. And, uh, and his work is really relevant and can be considered so uh, a starter of, of many of many disciplines, like for example, so computing science or or information science and many others. 
uh, one of the things that he provided in his first uh, approach to, to knowledge was, was the tree of knowledge. Hmm? And in the tree of knowledge is where you can organize hmm, all the knowledge. Hmm? You can imagine some kind of, kind of tree. <coughs> uh, the, the, we have many branches. Hmm? And in all these branches, each part, its ending, so represents a, a, some particular knowledge or particular discipline. But if we develop this, that in detail, we could we could here so develop the tree as to see all what can be said about about reality. Here is it, this. This is a, rep a representation of the unity of, of all the knowledge, as well as the diversity of all what we, can, we could uh, speak of, about. Uh, there's a lot of things we can deal, and, uh, and in, the, in the most developing sense, uh, as I mentioned, what we have is all the possible truths that we could uh, speak of. Um, Something interesting of, of his biography is he was traveling all over the Mediterranean. He was, he was a, a monk, his priest, no? and, uh, and because of his uh, language knowledge, uh, he could read and, and, and uh, so, so get in contact with many, with many communities. And, uh, and often, often he reached courses in which there was religious fights. Hmm? And uh, something that, that he has observed and has learned from the from the Arabic uh, so scientific development, something that was interesting, it was kind of a kind of machine, a very simple machine, but uh, that is actually comes from from the the articulation of all the so the logic of Aristotle and uh, uh, through the combination so the combinatory of the of the Aristotelic logic what enable us to to find out is that that a proper change of propositions is is correct so we are we are doing a, a proper proper conclusion this conclusion is correct this is something that we can find out through through this Aristotelic logic. And, uh, and this uh, simple machine that was developed in the, by the Arabs uh, could enable uh, could enable so to distinguish so whether one uh, one combination of, of propositions was correct or not. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, up to this point. He tried to develop a combination of these both ideas, trying to represent all the knowledge and trying to find out from some basic uh, truths. That we cannot uh, do it about. Hmm? Through these ba basic truths, uh, you can uh, develop all all the three, all the correct truths, all the all the other ones. Hmm? And uh, what is said, it's kind of layered, is that when they were fighting, uh, he would try to to stop the fight and say, "Don't fight anymore. Just let's try to see. So what you are really saying." and what the others are saying, and maybe we will see that either we're talking about the same thing, but through different ways, or we're talking to two different things, and there's no reason to, to, uh, to discuss about, or maybe one of them is wrong, you know? and it, because, because there's a, some failure in the change of propositions, or, or in the change of... Uh, so, this was... Uh, I think uh, this is a nice representation of how can't we uh, compute uh, our knowledge from the, in the classical picture. This idea, this was developing what he what named the Ars Magna, that was taken by Leibniz. Leibniz is philosopher scientist of the 17th century, and uh, and and uh, starting from from. Uh, Lul's idea, he also developed his idea and a kind of project of organizing the knowledge and his idea is that at the end all the scientific discussions will not 
we keep on arguing. Uh, we will just sit down. The idea of the math is universal is that we will sit down and, ju and just will say, let's compute. Do not discuss anymore. Let's compute. Hmm? So it's very much related, as you, as you may see. Hmm? So, but in the, in the 19th century, we have another figure which is quite interesting. So I've been talking about so Lul. And uh, what we have in the in the 18th century is also a very interesting representative of, of this classical picture, who is Laplace. Mm -hmm. Laplace uh, makes a kind of, of thought experiment, or or what is named uh, so the, the Laplace demon. The Laplace demon. Uh, the idea is that uh, is that it. it it's like a, a, a person uh, who has the possibility to, to compute very properly. So, for example, knowing the basic laws of how, uh, so the dynamics, the mechanical, the, the mechanical dynamics uh, as studied by Newton. If, uh, if you gave me, if you gave me all the position and, and the, sorry the position and the speeds of all the points of the universe, this uh, demon could find out how the past was and how the future is going to be. So this is the basic idea. And, uh, and I think it represents very well, so, this, this the, the, so the, the classical picture uh, that is very much related as well to the mechanical universe. So as you know, so Newton, when Newton developed his, his mechanic, he, he was doing something uh, very interesting, actually studied by others like Galileo, that was to integrate in all the physics just in, in, a, in a very small set of basic truths. Mm -hmm. these, these basic truths are the basic laws of, of the mechanics, but uh, a problem of the, of, the, of the Newtonian mechanics was that in order to determine so the trajectories of the of the planets, uh, he could not handle the position and the, and the speeds and the effects, the gravitational effects of all the planets at the same time. Hmm? Even in in his Principia Mathematica, he discusses about so how to determine the orbit of the Earth, and he says, of course, uh, Jupiter uh, must play a role. In, uh, in how the trajectory of the Earth is going to be, but um, but he cannot handle. Uh, actually, as we know today, just the problem of having just three masses is too complicated as to determine so only only one path. Hmm? This is something maybe uh, so Tana can tell us as well. Um, so something that he that uh, that Newton advanced uh, in order to explain what was happening, because uh, behind all the all, all the, um, so the so the positivistic picture of, of, of Newton, there is also a, so a part of his concerns that are much more related to theological ideas and magical or somehow magical, not not magical. Uh, but his idea to explain what was going on is that maybe uh, so when you consider all the all the planets is like a kind of friction, and that friction could have the effect that at the end the orbits of the trajectories of the planets, like for example the Earth, would slow down, hmm? and if it slows down, then it can crash. It could uh, collapse. The solar system could collapse. So his idea was that God uh, comes uh, once in a while and, and makes that the machine keep on going. Mm -hmm. So and uh, you you can find there's some readings where, where he speaks about. Them. So the so the machinery, the solar machinery, 
uh, it, it does not stand for itself. It's somehow uh, assisted by, by, by God. But in the 18th century, it happens that uh, they start to say, what happened uh, if God forgets? Hmm? Or what about if God that doesn't exist? Hmm? So what, what could happen? So it starts to be a kind of problem, uh, of course, scientific problem, but it could have some sociological concern as well, because the people were worried, actually. So the science had be become more and more important that all the scientific uh, so truths uh, become more relevant. So actually, it was very impressive, all the, all the Newtonian mechanics, because you could determined not only what was happening in the in the sky, but also what was happening in the earth. And you can predict so many things about about the stars, uh, how it was, how it's going to be, and afterwards after observation, you see that, that it happened. So it was impressive. So it was like touching all the truths. Eh? So because of that, uh, so the uh, so the relevance of science and the and the uh, trustfulness of science have keep, has keep on growing. Therefore, it was important to handle this question. And Laplace, eh, the, the same one I mentioned before, eh, tackled the, the problem and, uh, and developed one of the most interesting works at the end of the 18th century that was the trying to understand all the, so the planetary and, est and stellar eh, so dynamics. And one of the things that he found out, it was something that, that the people were, uh, were waiting for. And is that the planetary system is stable. That's, that was what he could determine. He could, he could not determine uh, so, so how the position of the planets was going to be. Because in order to do that, so the, his demon would need at the same time to know all the position and all the speeds of all the elements of the, of the planetary system. And this is something that we can't, uh, as you can imagine, that's, that's simply too difficult, but this is only a problem of information. So if the information were provided to this demo, he could compute it. Uh, so the idea is that that could be possible. But because, uh, because our uh, knowledge is not deep enough, uh, then we at least can say what Laplace determined is that it doesn't matter how it's going to be exactly, but what we can find out is that this is a stable, and even if we have so the trajectory, uh, the orbit changes a little bit, it goes to it goes to come back to the same orbit again afterwards. So this is a very important finding uh, that afterwards uh, was contradicted by uh, a fundamental theory uh, posed by Corporo, Arnold and others, uh, the key, key AM uh, theory that says that we cannot determine so the, the trajectories of the planets eh? because they just, just the kind of precision that we would need uh, the accuracy that we would need for each of these data, just the position of, of one of the particles of the universe, uh, the kind of information we should collect would be infinite. Because a very small change in, in one of these data uh, represents at the end very, very large uh, consequences and very, very uh, different uh, results. So what, what we have now, uh, after not, not only after Laplace, so Laplace is very well represented by this, by this demon, the demon uh, that by knowing the position and, and the, the speed of all the points, can be, we can determine all what, what it was. <laughs> So the past and what it's going to be. So past and future. What we have uh, after the key AM uh, theorem
is that what we have is actually a kind of bifurcation in which uh, even if we are here in one point and we can't determine with, with a good accuracy uh, so this, this situation, what happens is that the, the development that comes afterwards can follow different paths. So in comparison to that, uh, the, the classical picture were like a kind of, of, of direct line that we know, we know here, this point, uh, determined by the combination of all the positions and, and the speeds of all the elements, and then we can go to the future or we can go backwards. There's only one line, and that means as well that there's no freedom. So, so something that that is uh, that confront that, that that has to confront the science uh, from the me the mechanical uh, uh, so the classical picture is that what happened with freedom? How freedom is possible if if, if this is the case? Hmm? If, if this if it happens that that we can determine so in the, the past or the future, it doesn't matter that we don't know it. So that means that there's only one way. But what we know actually after the counter and not only that, uh, what what we really know is that is that the future is somehow open and and, and even as as we know from the from the quantum mechanics, even some parts of the past can't be dependent on on what is going to happen afterwards. Because, because some of the possibilities are actualized and so on. So it's a little bit more sophisticated problem and we could uh, remind as well some other interesting uh, keystones in this development which is the, for example, Gödel, Gödel find out something that, that contradicts so the project of Lul, of Ramon Lul. Uh, what Kudel finds out is that even for a system of truths quite similar, quite, quite restricted, a system of a theory as the as the numbers with with some few operations, only that system uh, cannot be completely assured that all the truths that, that are managed within the system. Uh, are, are, are of that kind, are really truths. So what we know, even in the, in the mathematics, we could represent some of the axis of the, of the theories, of other uh, scientific theories. There we have this kind of problem that, uh, that if we want to keep it complete, to have, like in the Ramon Lul tree, all the branches, all the leaves of the, of the tree, then some of some of these leaves have to be considered that 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 they are correct, but we don't know. How, we cannot develop so from the so from the from the roots, so to say. And another interesting uh, milestone in in this in, in the development of. Of the of the new understanding is, for example, the Heisenberg. Or it can be represented. It's not only these are just some some people who are representative of, of the scientific understanding. Do you know the Heisenberg principle? Can somebody say what what it more or less? We cannot predict the time and the position of a particle. Uh, Mm -hmm. Specific. Uh -huh. not, but not only predict, but we cannot know, we cannot measure, we can because we so that that is it goes again to this problem. So if we can in this case what Heisenberg says concerning so our best knowledge of how matter really works, so the quantum physics as far has provided one of the of the best theories that has been developed within the scientific system, uh, is that even this question of Laplace is in principle uh, unfeasible. So we cannot know this uh, at the same time the position and the speed or the position and the momentum. So therefore, if this is at the beginning in principle unfeasible, then we cannot develop this idea of this deterministic idea of, of Laplace. We cannot know how it's going to be. 
Uh, in a, I'm going to do just just a last metaphorical approach. But what we have, so to say, is like we have the tree of rule of better, better, let's go back. <laughs> we have this tree of null and, uh, and after, after this consent, for example, of, of Heisenberg, what, uh, what we have to admit is that there are like, we don't have a, on the one hand a unique tree, what we actually have is like kind of forest, and, but we can simplify as having a couple of, of, uh, of trees. Each of these trees have their own leaves, and uh, on the one hand, hmm, the picture of Lul was somehow static, so we have those leaves, we have those branches, we have this tree, is the but what we actually want to manage nowadays is, is to know the, probably the dynamics and not even in the sense of Newton because Newton, the kind of dynamics that is provided by Newton is so to say a frozen dynamics but we want to know uh, how it's going to develop uh, in reality uh, in, in that open manner that was, that was uh, so troubled before so what we have is that uh, uh, the, the, the trees are somehow uh, interwoven. <laughs> we have we see leaves that belongs to one tree or belongs to other tree, but but these leaves uh, move at the same time. These are not static static leaves. And what happened is that when we want to determine whether one one of the one of the leaves belongs to one to one of the trees or to the other, then uh, then we get, for example, so like the position. So we can know uh, that this leaf belongs to one of the trees, but then we don't know whether it was moving or not. And if we get to know whether one of the leaves is moving, then we cannot know whether it belongs to one tree or the other. So this is like like reality, so to say, so us, is, is so enough to us. <coughs> and we cannot determine, on the one hand, we cannot determine how it precisely is. Uh, we actually observe reality from, uh, from our limited uh, senses or all our uh, limited understanding of how it really works. So, as uh, Spinoza said, uh, from uh, modality, um, so it's how, how we can uh, access to, to reality, but reality is much more complex. Hmm? But uh, our, our problem, and, and Reiner, what is Reiner is going to develop, is to, pro to offer us a kind of access to understand and to manage uh, this uh, so this complexity, to understand complexity and to see it in a very specific case, the case of the city. Thank you. <laughs> uh,